Good morning. I said good morning. Okay, all right, there we go. Hey, good morning and uh, happy Mother's Day. Um, I, want it, I have a kind of a fun little video to play and then I want to share a Mother's Day prayer with you. So um, if you turn your attention to the screen and then we'll, we'll, we'll pray together and worship. Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. No, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah, thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The Mom Personal Assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom... Please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey, mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked. It's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. That's, I know that's just silly fun. Um, but listen, Mother's Day means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, some good and some bittersweet or even sad. And um, the, the longer I've done this, the more I've heard feedback that, hey, Mother's Day is sometimes, I hear, I hear people all the time say, I avoid church on Mother's Day for a variety of reasons. Um, and with that in mind, I have a prayer uh, here by a colleague of mine, Reverend Megan Perdue, that I wanted to share this morning, recognizing that Mother's Day may, may mean a lot of things for a lot of people. And it says, God, you are the giver of life. In your creativity, you made a way for us to reproduce, to bring new life into the world. For all of our mothers who bore us in their rooms, carried us in their bodies, and brought us into the world, we are grateful and give you thanks. On this day set aside to remember our mothers, we also recognize that there are many for whom this day brings a multitude of feelings and a variety of memories. For those whose mothers have died, who are no longer able to give them a call or reach for a hug, we ask God that you would comfort those who are missing their mothers today. For those mothers who have lost a child, we pray for your comfort and deep, unending love. For those whose mothers are far away, separated by physical distance, by illness that results in emotional distance, or those among us who are estranged from their mothers, we ask for your healing spirit, for the hope of your resurrection, which makes all things new. There are also women we know and treasure who hope to be mothers, but have not been able to for lack of partnership, life's timing, or as a result of infertility. For these women, God, may your spirit of love and worthiness wash over them. May they find in your church the expanse of your great family and the welcome of mothers of all kinds. God, for those women who are mothers themselves, blessed with the gift and challenge of nurturing, loving, and caring for their children, we ask for your spirit of encouragement and endurance. May they seek you for strength and your community for support. For those expectant mothers, we pray for safety and peace as they prepare for this transition. May they know that we are with them. Triune God, who is both 
father and mother of all, pour out your spirit on your children as we seek you. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and worship together this morning.
is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the light. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the light.
Yesterday, uh, you can be seated as we um, remembered the life of, uh, of John Bourne with uh, Gene and Juanita Underwood and the Bourne family. John was a good friend of Gene's. Uh, just heard a powerful message of hope and of the way and truth and life that Jesus is, even in the midst of darkness, his light shines. And um, as we go to prayer, I just ask that you be remembering Gene and Juanita and John's wife, Amy, and, and uh, their, their daughters and his brother. And um, also ask that you'd remember Martine Toko, who's um, grieving the loss of her mother in Africa. And, um, and then uh, lastly, I just wanna make sure that everybody um, is aware, some of you uh, remember Pastor Reverend Ronald Mazim, who served as a youth minister here um, for several years and then has been our uh, District NY Vice President, the youth pastor at the Gordonsville Nazarene Church, um, passed away from a heart attack over the weekend, and um, just shocking. I mean, he was 40 years old, and um, so I'd ask that you'd be remembering Brandy, uh, Chris and Crystal Weiser uh, live next door to the Mazims, and so we just ask that you remember um, them, and Remember all the church, all of the students and um, friends in the church, and uh, the funeral will be this Wednesday at two o'clock at Crestlawn uh, Funeral Home. And um, for those that would like to remember him, and then they've requested that uh, anyone who would like to, to to give in his memory to make checks out to ETNYI for the NYC Scholarship Fund, which is the event that Ronald was in charge of and really passionate about, and that's coming up this next summer for teens. And so that's uh, what Brandy is requesting in his memory and honor. Um, there are other prayer requests, uh, people dealing with illness and with tests coming up and things like that. But uh, this morning, let's go to prayer knowing that um, he's our rescuer, um, knowing that he's paid it all and that uh, our hope is not just for this world but it's eternal and it's, a beyond, it's beyond the evil that we, we face and the sadness that we are encumbered with um, in moments like these. Heavenly Father, we give you praise, first of all, because uh, you have nurtured, you've created and cared for and nurtured this world. And um, today as we celebrate motherhood, um, we're reminded of what a good, loving, caring, compassionate, merciful, kind, generous God you are, because we get to see that in um, our mothers. We've gotten to see that in uh, mothers in the church. We've, we're thankful for lots of wonderful mothers who set wonderful example and support one another, and we're thankful today for who you are. And uh, Lord, in times when we are sad, that's when we really need to know that you comfort and draw near to the brokenhearted, that uh, for those who mourn, they will be blessed because they will be comforted. And uh, Lord, we just lift uh, those that we've mentioned, all the friends and family of John Bourne and of, uh, of the Tokos in Africa and of uh, Ronald, Pastor Ronald Mazim. God, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And so as uh, the pastor said yesterday, if we feel lost, if we feel confused, if we feel dead inside over the grief that we're experiencing or just in general, life just seems to not be going our way, 
you are the answer to all of those heavy, heavy burdens. We celebrate you this morning and what you've done to make that possible. We celebrate the body and the blood that's been broken and poured out for us, that we could have that assurance and that hope. God, we just ask that uh, for all of the needs and burdens that we've uh, come here today with, that we would, as, as your word says, 1 Peter 5, 7, that we would cast down those burdens at your feet and trust that you care for us and that you are in control and good to take and carry those burdens for us so that we don't have to, to wash over us a peace that passes understanding and to give us a joy that strengthens our souls and to carry us above our struggles when we just feel like we can't even walk any further. God, we just pray that you would meet each and every one by your spirit today in this room, right where they're at, and give assurance and comfort in just the way that is needed. We love you this morning, and uh, we give you all glory, honor, and praise. All, all God's people said, amen, amen. And Pastor Ryan is going to give the announcements. All right. Ready to uh, clap twice. Good job. Hey, outside in the foyer, you've seen the table with a couple shipping boxes and some Cheez-Its and Lucky Charms and uh, chocolate chip chips. Those are the things that our missionaries, Joshua and Katie Hahn, cannot get in Sofia, Bulgaria. And so, uh, as Pastor mentioned last week, three of the birthdays are within like two weeks of each other. And so, uh, this is just a blessing to them that we're going to send them some things that they're missing uh, from here, as well as some Amazon cards. I think just to ship it was like 300 bucks. It's like $100 per box just to get it there. Um, so we need that money today. If you can just make a note on your check when you turn it in or uh, on the envelope, if you want to do cash, that would be great. Everybody clap twice. Uh, children's camp is this summer, and for whatever reason, uh, some people are glutton for punishment. And uh, pastor's going. And uh, if your child, if you are interested, um, Go see Pastor Stephen. He has the, the forms. I know we were looking for some this morning. Uh, he has those printed off, and he can give you those. Everybody clap twice. And lastly, we have a few birthdays today. Um, Anna Raymond, as well as Christina. Uh, Christina's in Florida, so she's not missing us this morning for sure. Uh, but they their birthdays are today. And then our friend Michelle McGregor has a birthday on the 11th. She is turning 33, and uh, so this week, uh, wish them a happy birthday, uh, and uh, we'll see some others in the lobby afterward. All the ladies, uh, after church, we have a little, a little gift for you. We're just celebrating um, the nurture, care, grace, uh, beauty that you bring to our lives, and we have a little gift for you after after church and pastor ryan will be out there in the foyer you can see him for that hey kids it's uh it's it's time for you to join uh miss callie and uh, mr cole there in the back to go to kids church and to learn um and from uh, what they've prepared from the scriptures this morning and uh the rest of y'all can turn to first corinthians 11 um We'll also, we'll take a jaunt over to a couple other scriptures this morning, but we're going to continue our discussion about communion today as we continue our study through the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, and uh, God, we just pray that uh, your spirit would open our eyes to experience your presence and to understand your character, your purposes, your mission for our lives as we study the scriptures, that you uh, Nobody would be impressed with anything other than what you are calling them to do this morning, that truly um, I would decrease, you would increase, that uh, we would worship you in uh, mind and body and spirit with all of our strength and all of our being, that you would receive glory and honor when we gather together to study, to learn, to sing, to give, and uh, to dine at the Lord's table in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.
Um, I'll go ahead and just say we will um, be uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper at the end of service, and so I want to let you know now, if you missed that, there are these uh, elements there on the back table, and so you can um, grab yourself um, elements at your convenience, and uh, I won't uh, call you out when you get up or anything like that. So um, those are back there on the table. Um, today, uh, we are going to complete 1 Corinthians 11. We actually, I told you uh, last week that uh, I, needed to break, I needed to break one sermon into two parts so as not to keep you until 1245 or so. And so this is a continuation of our discussion on 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 through 15 is what in um, hermeneutics we, we call uh, a movement in 1 Corinthians. It's a, it's a section that all kind of uh, works together when we do our exegesis, our study of this. We realize that this 11 through 15 is a whole conversation that's all linked together. We kind of jumped to the end of the conversation when we talked about the resurrection body um, before uh, or in the weeks leading up to Easter because uh, this whole section is about the body of Christ, the body of Christ being the church in this case. Um, but then as we go back to the beginning of the conversation, the beginning of the conversation starts with um, the gathering of, of believers around the Lord's table, the fellowship meal and the remembrance of the Lord's Supper. And so we have been looking at that. Pastor Ryan taught a couple weeks ago and then um, I began a look at the back half of 1 Corinthians 11 last week. We learned last week that the Lord's Supper is the center of gravity for the church. I kind of like set you up to, to fail. It's a trick question. I listed all these things, all these functions of the church, prayer and Bible reading and all of that, and asked you which is the most important. And it's kind of tricky because, listen, prayer and Bible reading are at the center of your spiritual disciplines and formation through the week. But if you think about it, all of that is all about what he's done for us. And what one thing do we do in the church that celebrates, remembers, uh, reflects on, and points um, into our own lives about uh, the center of our faith is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself anointed and passed down the tradition of the Lord's Supper Communion is what we call it in some places. Eucharist is another term, which is, which is uh, Latin for thanksgiving. Um, and so these, the bread and the cup that Jesus blessed is at the center of his church. And for a long, I closed last week just pointing out that for a long, long time, instead of the pulpit being at the center, there was a table, and the pulpit was off in the corner. And the way that worship gatherings worked for hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus um, ascended into heaven was that actually this, the gathering began with a meal, and much like Passover, the bread was broken at the beginning, and then at the end of the meal, the cup of blessing was taken, and we remembered the Lord's body broken, and we remembered the cup of, of his blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin, and then the rest of the worship service began. Then the songs were sung, and testimonies were given, and encouraging words were given, and teaching was given, but the Lord's Supper was the center of it all. The Lord's Supper was what sparked everything else. So at the center of his church is the Lord's Supper. And I ask you to think about what does that mean for us as a church? And we'll be discussing that as a board for the next few months, trying to figure out what God would have us do. And what does that mean for how you live your daily life as the member of a body of believers uh, representing the body of Christ? So just to uh, remind us of what we read in the scriptures last week. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, and we'll be reading uh, all 18 verses here, 17 to 34. It says, In the following directives I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it's not even the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, they don't get anything to eat, and the other gets drunk on the wine that represents Jesus' blood. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing 
by not sharing is what he's saying. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, remember we said last week what that means is to drink, eat or drink without giving it the worth that it deserves, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, this meaning the gathering of believers specifically, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we had judged ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, friends, when you come together, eat. Wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. This is the word of the Lord. Let me, uh, let me do that again. When the leader of the assembly of worshipers says, this is the word of the Lord, the congregation responds, thanks be to God. So this is the word of the Lord. Good job. We're learning that in our household too. So uh, we'll just all learn it together. Now, uh, I would really, really encourage you, if, if you're coming into this cold, to go back on YouTube and watch the discussion last week because um, there's probably been one particular way that this passage has been unpacked for you. And uh, I spent a lot of time reading and studying and didn't really find a lot of confirmation of the way that it's often been unpacked. And so I'd encourage you to go and to read uh, or, or to watch that to learn kind of the context of what's going on and what all of these interesting things mean. And also the significance of what it was when Jesus said, this is my body and this is the cup of the new covenant when at Passover, at the Passover meal, he changed the liturgy. He, he transferred the celebration of Passover to the Lord's Supper. So anyway, lots of interesting stuff. That's what we really dove into last week. Uh, this week, I want to look more specifically at what happens. What do we do when we come and we break the bread and we drink the cup? What is it that God calls, teaches? Um, what is it that, that the Lord Jesus would have us do and think about and consider when we take the bread and the cup, whenever we're preparing to take the bread and the cup. So generally speaking, we think of communion, I think, in mostly one-dimensional terms. Like the moment that we take communion, we think about Jesus on the cross forgiving our sin. True or not true? True, yes. But Paul, in this passage, he sees a lot more depth here. He sees shades and layers of color and multidimensional engineering. There's a lot more going on at the communion table than just that. And so today I want to discuss the six aspects, facets, or dimensions of the Lord's Supper whenever we partake of communion with God through the sacrament. What is happening when we take communion? What are the, the six ways that I see here in this passage to um, engage with God and to think about what the bread and the cup mean. So the first dimension, dimension number one, if you're taking notes, the backward dimension, the backward dimension of communion. When Jesus broke the bread, he said, this is my body. Do this in what? Remembrance. And so uh, we look backward to the cross and remember what happened. This is the dimension that probably most of us are familiar with, but it is very, very significant. When Paul says anyone who comes to the table needs to drink in a worthy manner, needs to give the Lord's table the worth that it deserves, what he's saying is don't ever, 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 ever forget what happened on the cross. Don't ever, ever, ever forget what Jesus did to make this the significant and powerful and transformational remembrance and sacrament that it is. 
And we get that, I think, for the most part, but maybe sometimes we become a little numb to what a big deal it is. We hear all the time about the death of Jesus, and I think maybe sometimes we get a little bit oblivious to the internal importance of the sacrifice we remember. I am often inspired by those of you that cry a little more easily because it helps me get into the frame of mind to say, that's not silly, that's not weak, that's not overly emotional, that is how significant this is. That's how, that, that you would, those of, those of you that do that so naturally, you have a gift from the Lord to constantly connect with the power and sacrifice and love that the Lord's table signifies. So please keep doing it because we need reminders we need to never become oblivious to or downplay how significant it is that Jesus is our atonement. It's a fancy theological word. To atone for something, according to Webster's Dictionary, is to fix something or make reparation for something. The uh, Bible word would be reconciliation, that Jesus reconciles us before the Father. He pays the debt. The theological definition in the Nazarene Manual, in the most recent edition, says we believe, this is, this is our, our, one of our articles of faith, atonement, we believe that Jesus Christ, by his sufferings, by the shedding of his own blood and by his death on the cross, made a full atonement, a full payment, a full reconciliation and reparation for all human sin, all human sin, and that this atonement is the only ground of salvation and that it is sufficient for every individual of the human race when they repent and believe. Atonement, 1 John chapter 2, you could turn there in your Bibles, and you could read some wonderful, encouraging words from John, the revelator, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the, the only apostle who wasn't martyred but died a natural death. He says, now keep in mind the context here is, he, he says, if we claim to be without sin in 1 John 1, 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. And then he says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Jesus' aim, his goal in sending the Holy Spirit and dying on the cross is not just forgiveness, but it's that we would grow in holiness and righteousness in preparation for his kingdom and where we would be glorified to an eternal righteousness, not our own, but what with which he clothes us with. I write this to you so that you will not sin, but this is what atonement's all about, okay? But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate, love that term, with the Father, we have an advocate. Another translation says that uh, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. That's what an advocate is. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, meaning Jesus Christ, the one without sin. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So his will is that we would not sin. But if we do, he's paid for it. He's paid it all. Amen. Amen? He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. <laughs> Woo! He's paid it all. Past, present, future. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, and that atoning sacrifice becomes yours, and you're washed in the blood, and you're white as snow, and now you've been empowered to be free and live free from sin, becoming less like yourself and more like him, being clothed in his righteousness, exchanging your sin he took into himself on the cross and receiving from him his already white and righteous robe as a free gift simply because we believed and put our trust in him. That's atonement. That's the backward dimension of communion. When we take communion, we look back and we remember that God in Jesus jumped in front of the wages of our sin. 
The wages of sin, the product of sin, the result of sin is always death, always destruction, always ruin. Our enemy is like a roaring lion prowling around to see who he might devour. His goal is to ruin, corrupt, pervert, steal everything good. But Jesus says, the Scriptures tell us that Jesus jumped in front of the destruction that was ours. Jesus, the, the Scriptures teach us that though that cross was supposed to be our cross, though our stupidity was supposed to lead to our demise, Jesus jumped in front and he took it into himself. In his great love, in God's great love for us, he allowed for his son to jump in front and take us as his inheritance. Jesus could have stayed in heaven, sat at the right hand of God, and received all of God's glory as his inheritance, but instead he said, no, what I want is I want those who, I, who we created in our image, I want to give them another chance, and another one, and another one, and I want to redeem them from all of the brokenness that they've invited into the world. And I want to renew that world, and there, would, there is nothing that would give me more joy or more satisfaction than for my love and my mercy and my compassion to be satisfied by removing all of the evil from the world, by taking it into myself, washing it in the blood of my righteousness and extending my clean robes to anyone who believes that I did exactly that and that I rose from the dead, conquering all of the power of sin and death. And Jesus was betrayed, as verse 23 said, or given over and made subject to. And remember, he said, no one takes my life, but I lay it down willingly. Jesus, in Jesus' love, you say, I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm not asking you to be worthy. I'm asking you to give worth to what I've done. That's it. Believe it. Receive it. Worship me and me only. And it's yours. When you come to the table, you remember what happened to Jesus, should have happened to you, and you stand at that table by the scandalous sheer grace of God. You have no right to come into God's presence, and at the same time, you have every right in the world. On your own, you have no right. But Hebrews tells us, because of what Jesus has done, because we have a high priest who empathizes with all of our weaknesses, who was tempted in every way, but remained without sin and chose then to allow himself to be a perfect atoning sacrifice, we can go right into the throne room of the Father as though we were his very own son. You have been made right with God because you are, in the vernacular of the Scriptures, in Messiah Jesus. We don't come to the table to get forgiveness. We come to the table because we are forgiven. <laughs> when we come to the table, we recognize that we were doomed, <laughs> but he atoned for our sin. Jesus experienced the wrath of sin so that you can experience God's love. Jesus went through death and hell so that you can experience life forever in the new creation. So we take communion in remembrance of him. We give worth to communion in light of this gift. That's the backward dimension. The backward dimension of communion, Timmy, is remembrance. That's the dimension most of us know. May we not become numb to its significant meaning. The second dimension. It's the forward dimension. The forward dimension is hope. The forward dimension is hope. Verse 26, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You look forward to the Lord's resurrection. Just as his death brought resurrection, we also will receive in us the resurrection. Just as we've received the blood from his death, just as the wounds of his death brings healing to us, we will also receive the eternal resurrection. 
And so you look backward to the cross, but when we take communion, we're also to look forward to the day that Jesus returns and unleashes his kingdom forever. You look forward to the redemption of the cross, washing over humanity completely and eternally, putting the whole world back together. You look forward to not merely remembering Jesus, but breaking bread and drinking from the cup in Jesus' physical and glorious manifest presence. We will be with God forever. And so when we take communion, we look forward in hope. We eat that bread and we drink that cup and we say, thanks be to God. I thank God that he picked me up and he healed my shame and that I will enjoy his presence forever at his table. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance, he doesn't say, do this in remembrance of the cross. He says, in remembrance of me. So just as we remember the price he paid, we also remember that he rose from the dead. I believe if all he wanted us to remember was the cross, then he would have said so. There's more to remembering Jesus than just remembering the cross. There's the burial, the resurrection, and his life before that and his life after that. And what will happen when he returns? We remember Jesus, period, all of Jesus at the Lord's table. The cross, yes, but also his life, his teachings, his miracles, his habits, the resurrection, of course, and the spirit poured out at Pentecost and the hope of the future. The Lord's Supper is a biblical signpost of future hope. The Lord's Supper is a biblical signpost of future hope. Before and after Jesus, the scriptures describe the beginning of the age to come in feast language. If you look at Isaiah 25, where Isaiah interjects amongst a lot of prophecies that ultimately come true about Israel's demise, he also, they, he also prophesies hope. And in that hope, when the city of God comes down on Mount Zion, he says, we will gather on the, on the hill of Mount Zion and nobody will be able to assault the Lord's city and we will eat, as Psalm 23 says, in the presence of our enemies. They'll try, but the light will push out all darkness, and we will eat and feast and drink with our Savior at the, at the, at the Lord's table. In Matthew 22, Jesus describes the kingdom of God as a great big feast, as a great big celebration. The more that you understand, as if you're reading through the Bible with us, and I hope that you would, you would pick that up even today if you're not. Um, if you're reading through, the more that you understand the way that God sealed remembrance of his character and his faithfulness in the Israelites through feasts, the more significant you realize that when Jesus comes, he, he just continues that tradition, and that's what the Lord's table is all about. We feast to look forward to, to look back, but also to look forward to what's coming. And in Revelation 19, it says that his kingdom, this new, uh, this new city and this new heaven and this new earth are ushered in with the wedding supper of the lamb, the marriage supper of the lamb, where his church joins together as a bride with Christ as the husband. So whenever we feast at the Lord's table, we look forward to when we will dine with Christ in the new creation. Whatever you're up against today, no matter how hard your life is right now, when you come to the table, may you look forward. <laughs> may, may you say, though I have trouble in this world, thanks be to God, Jesus has overcome this world. Jesus said, you will have trouble, but I have overcome this world. John 16, it's a great promise to cling to if you're going through something difficult right now. Though your life is hard right now, hope is here. And we're to remember it when we drink of the cup and eat of the bread. And new life is coming because Jesus is coming again. His body, his blood resurrected from the dead is coming and renewing all things. That's cause for celebration, which tells us that communion is not just a somber tradition. It's celebratory. When we've done the inward work, to examine our soul, as we'll talk about in a minute. And when we come away feeling as though the Spirit has said, it's well with your soul, 
then you can turn to celebrating and say, thanks be to God that hope is here, that I've been forgiven, and that new life is coming. I'm so glad Gene Underwood is awake this morning. Thank you, my brother. Y'all hear, heard me, right? All right, just checking. In fact, when we begin to live in the righteousness of Christ, the pendulum uh, of, of communion can swing so far that we have to be careful not to celebrate too much. That's one of the corrections that Paul gives the Corinthians. He says, hey, stop drinking so much. Save some for other people. <laughs> Wait on one another. Look out for one another. Make sure everybody gets to drink of some of this grace. Make sure everybody gets to break off a piece of that body and remember. This isn't in my notes, but it got me to thinking. I wonder what that means for our hospitality to one another. When you see someone missing, and would you reach out to them and say, we missed you today? Would you, would you tell them, we broke bread, and I hope, I hope that this week you'll remember that Jesus died for you, and that he loves you, and I love you, and how can I pray for you? Save some of the celebration for others. Allow it to compel you to compassion. Give it worth. Give a deep self-reflection, as we'll discuss in a minute, but also it's a passionate celebration. So the third dimension, the third dimension is the inward dimension. The third dimension is to examine yourself. There's a dimension to communion where we are called to look inside of ourselves. If we look at verse 28, a person ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now, I gave you some specific context in the Corinthian church last week, but it still stands that when you take communion, you are to create space to listen to the Spirit. You are to clear your mind from distractions, to say, like, to be a Mary and not a Martha, <laughs> to say, there's much to be done, but right now there's only one thing that matters, and that is to listen to Jesus. That is to sit at the feet of Jesus. So take those to-do lists and say, Holy Spirit, block those from my mind right now. Attune my eyes and my heart, and my mind to you. Take what you need to get done this afternoon, the lawn, washing the car, your meeting tomorrow morning at work, the really cute boy or girl next to you or a couple rows up for you or who's waiting for you with her family for lunch. Get all of that out of your mind and listen for the Spirit and ask the Spirit of God to expose sin in your life, to expose areas in your life where you're not in line with the bread and the cup, where you're taking for granted the forgiveness and not giving it its worth, where you're not in line with the story and life of Jesus. So not just the cross, but what did he teach? while he was on this earth, and what did he teach after he rose from the dead, and what did he call us to before he ascended into heaven? What did he tell us the Holy Spirit was for? Ask the Holy Spirit to show if there's any unclean way in me. This is an Old Testament practice and a New Testament practice. Ask the Holy Spirit to search and know your innermost thoughts and give you insight into how the Lord would like to with the transformational power of his broken body and shed blood bring you more into alignment with his righteousness. Certainly his forgiveness atones for you when you sin, but remember that God has come to us as his dear children so that we might not sin. So examine yourself. Examine yourself. Often the, answer we often the answer that we receive to, Lord, is there anything wrong in my life, will be yes. <laughs> That's my experience. Maybe you're better than I am. I don't know. But when that answer comes back yes, you repent before the Lord. When we, when we come to the Lord's table, we search ourselves, and we repent before the Lord when we realize. Maybe you need to just lean over to your spouse and confess to your spouse, I spoke too harshly with you. I broke your trust. I, I broke the code of our marriage, the things that we've agreed on. And before I go to the table, I want to make sure that you and I are right with one another. 
You may need, and that's why we try to bring the kids back in whenever we take communion, because we want them to see, and we want them to experience, and we want you to have the opportunity to lean down to your child and say, this morning, I yelled at you as though this was just some kind of ritual that we have to fulfill so Pastor Stephen thinks we're good at home. But what I want you to know is that this is what it's all about. Jesus forgave me, and I need your forgiveness. Just like sometimes you need forgiveness. And when we come to the table, we seek the Lord for forgiveness. You may need to go to your brother or sister in Christ and say, I just want to make sure our hearts are clear towards one another. That exchange that we had via text message, I know I may have hurt your feelings, and I just want to make sure you know that I love you and that I'm sorry for not being, whatever. And you reconcile with whoever And then you move on because at the table you already have forgiveness. But Jesus taught that if you you come to the table and you remember that someone has something against you, if you come to the altar in that case, but now the table. If you come to the altar and you remember somebody has something against you, that means that either you've done wrong to them and so they they are bitter towards you or they've done wrong to you and you are bitter towards them. Jesus, Jesus taught, leave your gift at the altar. Stop your worship. Put down your offering and go to that person and be reconciled. Don't finish, don't don't worship without being reconciled. Don't ask for God's forgiveness and stand in his forgiveness without offering the same forgiveness. The Lord's Supper calls us to action. It calls us to forgive as we have been forgiven, which Paul writes in several of his letters as reminders to the church, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Communion is a reminder and a command to examine ourselves and give account before the Lord so that he may be our atonement. But pastor, I thought you said last week that's not specifically what these verses mean. True. Communion is not for those who are worthy, and the first meaning of these verses is to remind us to not eat private suppers, but to recognize that communion is about the body of the Lord, the church. No one needs to have any fear about taking communion as though it's like jinxed if you, if you forget to ask forgiveness or you can't ask forgiveness and you eat and drink communion with sin in your life that it's going to be some kind of poisonous curse. But communion is a reminder of our need and inv- invitation to be washed clean. We need to be washed clean and Jesus invites us to be washed clean and being washed clean doesn't just happen between you and God. Remember, when, God, when, when they asked Jesus, what is the greatest command, he refused to separate our actions horizontally from our actions vertically. He said you can't have one without the other. If you love God, you'll love your neighbor, and if you're loving your neighbor, you'll love God. The Lord's Supper is a regular feast in which we receive atonement in which we celebrate atonement for the sin that otherwise makes us weak and tired and ultimately results in our death. Paul says, hey, if you come to the Lord's Supper and you don't feel the hope of the Lord, if you come to the Lord's Supper and you feel like life is just against you and you feel like you just can't get anything right and you're not worthy, you need to deal with sin because Jesus isn't the one making you weak and tired. Jesus isn't the one who's against you. He's for you. And he wants to wash that sin away. So deal with the sin. Confess it before the Father and receive forgiveness. And then confess it to your brothers and sisters so that you might be healed. James 5, 16. So remember that while God has atoned for our sin, we must confess it. We must repent of it. And we must carry a cross and follow him. Not all weakness and weariness and sickness and death is the direct result of your sin, but your sin does sometimes directly result in weakness, weariness, sickness, and death. Please understand that there is an enemy who seeks to devour you, and if you don't take sin seriously, which was one of Paul's main points in chapters 8 through 10, there are are lords, there are demons, there are princes of darkness behind the sin that plagues our lives. And so we must repent, we must give it, we must bring it into the light, and we must be reconciled with one another so that the seeds of bitterness cannot be sown between you. The Ephesians says that when seeds of bitterness are sown between people, it's a foothold for the devil. And do you know what footholds become? Strongholds. 
So we need to take our sin seriously. Sin doesn't always result in sickness, weariness, death, etc. But it doesn't never. Not always, not never. Does God cause this? No, sin causes this. Does God sometimes allow sin to run its course in your life, to discipline you? Yes. He allows sin to run its course in your life. And the wages of sin is what? Death. But how many of you, you know that discipline is option B when it comes to raising kids, right? It's not your first preference. Have you ever said to your child, this hurts me more than it hurts you, or I don't want to do this? It's true. Kids have a hard time believing it, but it's true. It's option B. We don't want to have to discipline. We want for them to just say yes to our careful and thoughtful instruction. We want them to just, what's option A? Option A is obedience. Option A is trust. (laughs) Option A is to walk in the goodness of the one who loves you. And often, there's quite a long leash because our love is compassionate and merciful and gracious. We know that it takes time to develop discipline and we want to give room to fail and to experience love. There's a point where you say, okay, grace, the grace is still there, but I need to let this run its course. I need to, to, to discipline in a way that communicates that ultimately this action is going to lead to death, to your destruction. There's a lot of grace and a lot of instruction and a lot of beckoning and a lot of coaxing and a lot of stern conversations about the consequences before we get down to the nitty-gritty discipline. But discipline does come. Verse 31, he says... If we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Discipline comes when obedience has been absolutely rejected. We are given this long leash to judge ourselves, to look inward and examine ourselves. But ultimately, a good father and a good mother will not let their child run to destruction unhindered. And so, that's why verse 32 says, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Communion is a loving reminder and invitation to examine ourselves and obey. Fourthly, there is an outward dimension. The outward dimension is you proclaim, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You testify. There's an outward to the world aspect to communion that we are called to when we take the Lord's Supper. Communion is a symbolic act that proclaims a message, but our actions confirm our words. I don't like to say speak louder than. I think it's important that we use words. I like to say actions confirm our words. And our actions should be based on Jesus' actions. Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, and then after proclaiming with his mouth the gospel, he breaks himself open and pours himself out to usher it in. And so likewise, as we remember the Lord's death for us, we take communion and we are called to join him in this story. You are called to break yourself open and pour yourself out to extend the good news of the kingdom of God to whomever God is putting in your path as you go to work and to school and walk through your neighborhood and go to funerals and weddings and graduation parties. As we go, proclaim the bread and the cup. Fifth, there's a sideward dimension. And no, I didn't make that word up. It is a word in the dictionary. Wanted to keep everything as a ward. <laughs> so it's a sideward dimension. What, or rather who, is on either side of you right now? Who is around you? Who makes up the body of the Lord that you are participating in today? Verse 29 Anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing, I'm just going to say church because that's what it means here, the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Paul says that we worship together. Last week I said when we eat private suppers, people get sick and die. We worship together. That's 
what Jesus intended. There's some confusion because we talk about Jesus being our personal Lord and Savior. But everywhere in Scripture, all the people that are personally saved by Jesus worship together, feast together, do life together. There is not a private dimension to your faith other than Jesus loved each and every one of you and died for each and every one of you. Every other part of your faith is communal, hence communion. So there's a sideward dimension. We recognize the church when we take communion. The bread symbolizes Jesus' body, and when we break off a piece of it, it shows how he was broken for you. But each one of those pieces then comes together to make a whole, the rest of the body attached to the head. By the time everyone takes a piece, we each have become one piece or one part of his body. When we take communion and remember Jesus, we think about, we recognize, we become a part of and commit to serve those around us, those on either side of us. So look around and ask yourself, is there anyone I'm not right with? Have I sinned against anyone? Is there anyone who sinned against me that I need to release? What are the needs around me and how can I contribute to meeting them? So how do we come alongside families with children and how do we come alongside uh, widows and orphans and how do we come alongside people who need help moving and how do we come alongside and serve in the church to further the ministries that nurture our souls but also reach outward? All of those things are things that we should commit, com, com, um, commit to remembering when we come to the table. There's a sideward dimension to communion. In coming to the table, consider these things. And then lastly, there's an upward dimension to communion. When we go to the table, something I cannot really put into words happens. It's not a literal ingestion of Jesus' flesh and blood as the church taught during the dark ages that it like transmutated so that you were cannibalistically partaking of the Lord. But we commune with God. We commune with God. You connect, engage, listen, and experience and encounter Jesus by the Spirit of God when you eat this bread and drink this cup. As cheap as this wafer is and as sour as this juice is, there's something that happens between you and the Holy Spirit that brings the presence of God as near as it can be. I cannot put that into words, but I know that it's real. It's not a lifeless ritual. Communion is not just symbolic. It is to encounter the spirit and presence of God. One of the concerns that we'll be processing as a church board, as I've done just some initial surveys of opinions, is that if we do communion on a weekly or more regular basis, does that make it less meaningful? Does it become rote and ritualistic? Well, I get that concern, but I also think, well, that's a personal problem because God's not any less near in communion one week to the next or any less available or any less powerful or any less forgiving and loving and atoning. That's on us. It's on me as a pastor and a shepherd to lead us with meaning into those things, and it's on you as a follower of Jesus to give it its worth every time we gather. It's our responsibility to receive it for what it is. There is no limit to communion with God and his power and presence when we come to the table. It's always available. It's a direct line anointed by Jesus himself to his presence. Jesus is here even now. So when we go to the table, we look metaphorically upward. But have you ever, I, we, it's just kind of natural what we do when we worship. We just look up. It's just kind of natural when you're out in creation like, and you're admiring things, you can't help but kind of look up into the light of the sun, like not directly because you'll go blind, but you know what I mean. You look up, you can't help it, you just, you're like, it's like you're breathing in the presence of God as you just bask in his glory. You don't look down, right? When, when you're basking in, the, in what you feel like is the presence of God, have, have you ever looked down? I mean, I was thinking about that in my office. I can't think that I have. So I might look down to 
to pray and look inward and to give respect, but when I'm just basking, I look up. And so that's what we do when we come to the table. We look up to the glorious and majestic presence of God. So I want to invite the worship team to come and in light of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus that has made this possible and that gives uh, this bread and cup its meaning and um, we're going to sing Jesus paid it all. And as we do, I want to remind you, these are the six things that happen when we take communion. And it may, by, may not be an exhaustive list, but that's what I gathered from the scriptures this week. So I want to encourage you as we prepare to take the bread and the cup, as we sing Jesus paid it all, and we look backward and we remember the atoning, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I want you to also think, to look forward to the hope of his coming kingdom. I want you to also take time to say, Spirit, is there any unclean way in me? I want you to take time to look outward, to say, am I proclaiming this in my everyday life or am I just eating a private supper? This morning as you partake, is this as far as the meal will go for you this week? Or will it spill over into your conversations with your spouses, with your kids, with your grandkids, with your coworkers? Will you allow, there's a question that, uh, that, that, that Travis and Drew and I ask in, our, in, a, in a little gathering that we have every week. It's the very first question we ask. Have you been a testimony to the greatness of Jesus Christ in both your words and your actions? At any point in this week, was there any intentionality to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes? It's a very convicting question, isn't it, Drew? Isn't it, Travis? We struggle with that, that one. We, 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 need, we all need to be more intentional. So consider the outward dimension. Consider the sideward dimension. These people that you're sitting with, we're family. And we're meant to worship and do life in Jesus Christ together. And consider that when we partake of this bread and cup, we encounter God. We encounter Messiah Jesus by his spirit. He's here He's among us, and he's meeting with anyone who's gathered here in his name. Heavenly Father, you paid it all. You are the atoning sacrifice for all sin, my sin. Our sin, the sins of the world. And we look backward and we remember that, but today, Lord, we recognize that there is so much more that you want to do your forgiveness unleashes on this world transformational power and hope that cannot be taken away, that's rock solid and firm in all circumstances. So Lord, as we sing, I pray that we would recognize these things, that we would examine ourselves, that we confess and repent sin that we'd consider those around us, saved and not, church family and those who you are drawing to yourself to be a part of your body. And Lord, that we would look upward, encounter your presence, and look forward to experiencing you more and more in our lives as you equip us by your spirit and by the means of grace that you've given us called communion or the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, amen. Let's sing this together. Let's uh, seek the Lord and remember and look forward and confess and repent as he has taught us. Now I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find. Change the leper 
Amen. And so I pass on to you what was passed on to me by the apostles who received it from the Lord Jesus himself, that on the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. And so I invite you to take the bread and to eat in remembrance of him. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So I invite you to take the cup and drink it in remembrance of him. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So may you go. May you proclaim the Lord's death to those who are lost, to those who are confused, to those who are dead. May you live in the hope of the resurrection. May you take seriously sin that seeks to kill and steal and destroy. And may you confess and be reconciled and healed in Jesus' name by the atoning sacrifice that he's made for our sin. 
may you look up and know that he is with us and he is for us. And may we live together reminding each other of this hope, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, remembering the Lord's supper and living it out together. And all God's people said, amen. Ladies, Pastor Ryan will uh, be out in the foyer in just a moment with a special gift for all the ladies. We celebrate you today and have a blessed day. You are dismissed.